Um, I'm sure you all know that blood can clot, and many of you who have had the misfortune to take biochemistry as a college course also know that there is a complicated pathway of proteins that is responsible for blood clotting. Dr. Behe argues, and Intelligent Design argues, that pathway is irreducibly complex. And again, what does he mean? None of these proteins do anything except clot. In the absence of any of them, blood does not clot and the system fails. So the argument is, the reason we know a creator had to create it or design it is because all the parts have to be present together. And the reason we know that is in the absence of any of the components, blood doesn't clot and the system fails. Now this is an argument made by Michael Behe. But it's also an argument that the Dover Board of Education wanted to present to their students. They got a copy, they got 60 copies, two classroom sets, of this intelligent design textbook, Pandas and People. Pandas and People makes the exact same claim. Only when all the components are present does the system function properly. Even though, uh, and us nasty evolutionary biologists point out, that all of these proteins, are almost all of them are serine proteases which means they were probably formed by successive rounds of gene duplication. But once again, they say all the proteins, no, nothing, unequ nothing equivocal here, all the proteins have to be present simultaneously for the clotting system to function. That's very interesting. Being an empirical scientist, I always want to say, is that right? Well, how could we test it? We could test it by taking this wonderfully complicated system and let's take a component away. Let's knock one out and see if they're right. Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment, there it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us, but it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving, and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now, taking one away, that's kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one away. Okay, fair enough. Um, how about we take three of these factors away? Well, it turns out the puffer fish, a genome that was sequenced just a couple of years ago, is missing the entire three-part contact phase system up there. The puffer fish has blood that clots just fine. So this argument about unevolvability, which is based basically on the argument that all the parts have to be present, it just turns out to be wrong. It falls apart. And this is something else that showed up in the trial. Um, this is technical information, but it basically shows that Doolittle has worked out an evolutionary scheme for how all the factors evolved from a single set of components that existed before blood clotting was evolved, and that leads to an evolutionary prediction. And the evolutionary prediction is shown over here and over here in another paper. And that is that the protein should have very specific relationships to each other, the different factors. And lo and behold, you can search the genomes of a host of organisms, and it does exactly that. The relationships match. So what this means with respect to blood clot is claims that you need every component to be present for biological function. That's the claim. Those claims are false. The second thing is a testable pathway has been proposed. I showed it on the previous slide. Careful analysis of that pathway shows it fits the evolutionary prediction, and there's absolutely no scientific support at all for any suggestion that the pathway was produced in a single step of creation or design. When 20th century scientists discovered the role DNA plays in heredity, they founded a new science called genetics that put Darwin's theory to the test. The cells of all great apes, like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, contain 24 pairs of chromosomes. If humans share a common ancestor with apes, you'd expect us to have the same number. But surprisingly, human cells contain only 23 pairs. Now, we share a common ancestor. What happened? Is it possible that in the line of evolution that led to us, a pair of chromosomes from a primate ancestor just got lost, it just got discarded. Well, the answer to that is no, it's not possible. And the reason is because every primate chromosome has so many important genes on it that the loss of both members of a pair would be fatal. It wouldn't even get through embryonic development. So there's only one possible explanation. And that explanation is that in the line that led to us, two chromosomes that were separate in other primates became fused to form a 
single chromosome. And this is why evolution is a science. That possibility is testable. We want to be able to look at our genomes and find that we carry a chromosome with the marks of that fusion on it. Now, how would we find that? It's easier than you might think. Typically, on the ends of every chromosome, you should find special genetic markers or sequences of DNA called telomeres. And in their middles, you should find different genetic markers called centromeres. But if a mutation occurred in the past, causing two pairs of chromosomes to fuse, we should find evidence in those genetic markers, telomeres not only at the ends of the new chromosome, but also at their middles, and not one, but two centromeres. Finding a structure like this in our chromosomes would explain why humans have one pair fewer than the great apes. If we don't find it, then the case for common ancestry for our species might be refuted. But if we do find it, it would be powerful evidence in favor of evolution. So all we have to do is to scan the human genome and see, do we have a chromosome that has these marks, telomere DNA in the center and two centromeres? Well, the answer turns out to be we do. And it's human chromosome number two. The evidence is unmistakable. We suspected this for a very long time, and in 2005, a definitive study was published showing that chromosome 2 has the exact fusion point, almost the point at which the scotch tape holds those two chromosomes together. The closer we look at our own DNA, the more detailed the glimpse we get of our own genome, the more powerful the evidence for our own evolution from common ancestry with other species that we know.